Hi folks, um, I hope you're all doing well in this new year. Uh, what's today? The 8th and of January and I'm um, just kind of getting a bit pumped up, primed up if you will for uh, my parent leadership group tonight. Um, I'm probably also a little jacked up because of uh, the radio interview that I did last night. Some of you already know that I uh, recently uh, was invited to do a monthly radio show on um, uh, or through a small station that serves the Fijian and South Asian community um, because they're as many communities are dealing with what they deal with and especially as it comes to um, you know immigrating to to Canada or the United States and and kind of what that can bring with it um, but certainly through technology that we have today and, and other things, um, much of what I speak of and what I address on the radio show is, is really more of kind of archetypal or, you know, kind of global themes that we're all seeing or if we're not seeing them, um, we will. We will very soon. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, as in all Tuesdays, I spend the day mostly in reflection about uh, what this evening is going to be about and and um, so I'm, I'm paying attention to that here uh, as I sit uh, sipping my coffee and and um, uh, here in the uh, in British Columbia and the Pacific Northwest of, of Washington State I was just outside uh, preparing uh, the inside fire for tonight and I was thinking, darn, it's cold out there. You know, it's probably just a few degrees uh, from being freezing. And then the next thing I look outside and it's starting to snow. So we haven't had any snow here yet. And I don't think it's going to snow hard today. But we're finally starting to get some of our snow. And uh, for those of you who are in other places of the country or the world, you know that the Pacific Northwest and British Columbia are well known for, for its very uh, moderate weather. Um, the only thing we have to worry about around here are volcanoes, and that hasn't happened in hundreds of years. So, uh, well, if you want to count Mount St. Helens, etc., you know, that was it. But we're in what's called the Pacific Rim, so we're surrounded by, by active volcanoes. Um, and so earthquake and volcanoes are what we worried about over here. But, you know, it, it rarely, rarely, rarely happens. So, um, anyway, thoughts for today. You know, I'm, again, I'm looking at the issues of entitlement and indulgence. You guys know that I've been doing that since 1993 and how that impacts society. And one of the things one could say about inflated, the inflated sense of entitlement that has permeated our uh, our, our society is that it, it, on one hand, it, well, as I mentioned before, it creates polarity. That's what the immature mind does. The immature mind has a is a black and white mind. It's a polarized mind. It's a schismed mind. Um, it's a divided mind. And so, whenever immaturity shows up, we're going to see schisms. We're going to see factions. We're going to see divisions. Um, the inability to fuse things together or to find unity in a middle ground. And of course, you know, many people are saying right now that, especially in the United States, that our country is very, very divided. Um, and I think North America is experiencing that in a big way, and as is, you know, other parts of, of, of Europe and, and, you know, across the globe. But just to say that immaturity um, and it, and inflated senses of entitlement will lead to polarization. And one of the reasons why there's polarization is, be, um, is because when people feel a inflated sense of entitlement, what comes with that is an indulgence. That's how those two are tied together. That entitlement leads to indulgence. And whenever... I was thinking about this yesterday. It's like whenever, what is what is one way of, of describing an indulgence? An indulgence is is something that we do that we know we shouldn't do, 
And the reason why we do things that we know we shouldn't do is because those things are seductive. So an indulgence can be called a guilty pleasure. Um, so think about it in terms of, of uh, one of the thoughts I was having was related to, to the use of substances. And so when people indulge in alcohol or drugs, let's just put it simply that way, is that what it does is it leads to a, a fee or a, a state of intoxication. People are, are not in their right mind. And when people are not in their right mind, right, they, they tend to, to do extreme things. Um, you know, boundaries blur, you know, uh, um, you know, again, just things get out of hand, things, uh, uh, you know, lines get crossed, things go sideways. Uh, you know, I remember attending a meeting one time and somebody was saying, he was talking about his own alcohol indulgence and he was saying, uh, you know, Every time, every time I drink, I don't get in trouble, but every time I get in trouble, I've been drinking. And that's the Russian roulette of an indulgence, if you will. You know, every time we indulge, we don't end up in trouble, but every time we're in trouble, we're probably indulging because indulgence brings with it a state of, of like intoxication. And when intoxication shows up, things go sideways real fast. And when that happens consistently, what has, has to happen is there's, a, as a, there's the opposite that begins to show up. The opposite being laws and rules. Makes sense, doesn't it? That when things get super out of hand and people can't manage themselves because of whatever they've been indulging in, then laws have to be set up. Legislation has to appear in order to, to manage it. So on the one hand of indulgence, there's this free-for-all kind of hedonistic way of living, this nihilistic way of living where nothing matters and you can do whatever you want. But then when that kind of begins to take its toll, take its effect, um, then on the other side, you see this legislation that starts to show up. So um, that's just let that sink in for a little bit. Think about that. that that's kind of one of the places we're at right now. In this, this place of indulgence where people want to do what they want to do, but then when people exercise that, it, you know, and this is always, like I said, it's a seduction. It's a Trojan horse, right? It looks good on the outside, but you try to put it into practice <clears throat> and things go sideways real quick. And then all of a sudden, all bunch of rules need to show up and, and there's more legislation, more government involvement, um, more restrictions, uh, more expense. So... Um, and that, that's happening all over the place. <clears throat> Excuse me. But one of the things that I wanted to mention real quick is, um, is this thing that I'm noticing around the polarization of created by, if you will, the, the kind of the victim narrative that has also permeated our society. And this has been coming for a long, long time. This this kind of rising up of the victim narrative. And when you when you move into that from, from an immature mind, what it sets up is the polarity of victim and oppressor. And because the nature of, of woundedness, and we've talked about this before, the nature of, of experiencing a traumatic or you know some, of a traumatic experience or being wounded by its nature inflates a sense of entitlement, and it creates a, a, a self-occupation, a preoccupation with oneself. And when, as I was thinking about this, and, you know, we can, we can see it everywhere right now. I mean, there's so many different educational things going on uh, right now around, uh, you know, trauma-informed this, trauma-informed that, or the, the topic of ACEs, you know, adverse childhood experiences. And so there's a, just a tremendous focus right now, or it could be the op opioid addiction, tremendous focus right now on the trauma that people have experienced and the victim narrative. And yet the nature of the trauma experience causes people to become self-focused. 
It makes sense, right? When we're hurting, we start to think about ourselves. Now hold that right there for a moment, that, that, that construct. Now add to it, you know, I was thinking about the whole addiction idea right now. Uh, one of the big responses to that is that, is that, you know, is that trauma is also related to this, but that people use substances because somewhere in their life they've been traumatized, which kind of equals the loss of attachment. Right? So there's this idea that, that in order to heal, in order to, you know, to free oneself of, of any kind of indulgence, any kind of addiction, uh, many other issues that, that wounds cause, uh, the, the cure to that is attachment to human beings. So can you start to see where we're headed right now? There's this, you know, there's this precipice that we're headed to. There's this inflated sense of entitlement that's going on, which causes us to be self-centered and narcissistic. And then you add to that the victim narrative, which, which by its nature causes pe people to become self-focused. And if, if, if a significant part of the population begins to move into that direction, and yet here's another significant idea in the, in the population that says in order to heal, you need to heal through, if you will, the kindness and compassion of other people and other, those kinds of relationships then who's going to have the capacity to do that? You see, because when one is wounded, when one is, is, has an inflate, inflated sense of entitlement, one is not interested in showing compassion or forgiveness or tenderness or thoughtfulness. You know, one is not interested in, 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 in showing that to other people. One is only interested in showing that to oneself. I've always said, you know, when it, when you really look into what we would call, you know, kind of traditional trauma, in, in, you know, in psychology, you know, it means abuse, neglect, what have you, is the reason why people abuse other people is because people are self-obsessed. They're, they're unable to empathize. They're unable to, you know, to show compassion. Let's say unable, maybe, un more, maybe the term more is unwilling. And you look deep enough into those folks and you probably see the people who have hurt people have also been hurt. And so there's this way where, as you can already begin to see, is that inflated entitlement plus victim narrative creates an incredible amount of self-focus and self-obsession, causing people to be incapacitated in their ability to be present with each other, which kind of passes the disease on. It's like a contagious disease. So people can't be present for other people. People will not extend other people compassion or, or empathy or sympathy or sensitivity. <clears throat> and so that ends up wounding the next generation. And there's this, what I think is we're moving towards this precipice. You see, because one of the things that I've spoken on previously is is the question of how do we continue to be, if you will, the best of ourselves in the presence of adversity? So in other words, even though we are wounded, even though we are hurt, how do we continue to be the best of ourselves? And I believe the answer to that is, the, the, is to be connected to what I call the grand logos or a grand narrative. We have to be connected to a vision, something that lifts us up, that can hold us up out of the mire of, of what the trauma does. So even though we're wounded, we can continue to be true to ourselves. But we can't do that if, if, if our vision becomes driven by, you know, by indulgence and by the victim narrative. It can't be done. You know, it's like trying to lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. It can't be done. The only way we get lifted up is by grabbing something bigger than us 
taller than us, you know, and we can pull ourselves up maybe, but most often we're lifted up. This is how we overcome. And historically, we've always overcome by being connected to, to great meaning, by finding purpose, by finding meaning, by being connected to a great story, what we call the grand mythos. But this grand mythos has been, you know, you know, very aggressively uh, attacked and, and um, you know, deflected and, and um, you know, people look upon the grand, uh, grand ideas with indifference. And, and by default, this is where, where we often end up. So those are a few of my thoughts right now. Um, I haven't produced a video in quite some time. Again, something to think about. Appreciate your feedback. Um, if you happen to be in the you know, in the Surrey, British Columbia area on, on a Tuesday night and you're a parent, or even if you're a professional and you want to come and check it out and say hi, uh, you know, drop me a message just to make sure that, that our group is running that night, but it usually is from 6 to 8 on every Tuesday night. Um, and uh, so, like I said, this, this evening I'll be sharing this information and these insights with the parent leadership group. I mean, these are the kinds of ideas that we all need to be thinking about. And I was saying on the radio show last night that, you know, people usually ask questions around, well, you know, how do you establish boundaries? How do you, you know, that's all kind of practical, but, but I really want to help people take the discussion much deeper because there's some really deep shifts going on right now uh, across the board in so many things. Uh, and, and we parents need to provide some anchoring, if you will, some stability. We need to attach ourselves to to something greater, so we can we can navigate this and and uh, you know do ourselves a favor and, and our families and our, and our society a huge favor um, by stepping up to the plate. So um, you know, have a great day. Thanks for for tuning in for a few minutes here, and uh, I'll post some some more thoughts here in the next couple of days. Take care.